Ooh, feels good to be here for the last one. Oh, I gotta get my phone. I don't remember how to do this. If you fail the LO4 quiz second try and still have three LOs left, can you use your RO? Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's what ROs are for. If you fail anything that is part of a, le a learning objective. Uh, quiz four the and three, actually. The RO chances, I mean, they have to be during finals week. We'll try to do them as quick as we can. Those will be myself and Paul. Uh, we won't have a round with TA, so we'll handle the scheduling there and, and uh, get you through. Assuming. Hopefully that just doesn't apply to anyone. I think we made the LO4 quiz pretty straightforward enough, and it didn't really change from last week. Uh, hopefully everybody was able to get through that. Uh, so what we want to talk about today is genetic algorithm. And Paul wimped out. He didn't even do it. He just uh, did a part three on his app that he was building. So, uh, so I'm the only one doing the genetic algorithm solution. I don't think it's going to take 50 minutes. So if you all want to see anything else, actually, something did get a bit of traction, hacking programs and sites. Uh, maybe I can try to just uh, freestyle something like that. Um, I might be able to, just breaking some sites. Um, maybe I'll do something off the cuff uh, like that. Or produce pong. Hack produce pong. Uh, yeah, I might hack produce pong. <laughs> we can do that. But let's do genetic algorithm first. That's what the people wanted. That's what the people shall get. Um, so I have my solution for genetic algorithm in true, and in true fashion for this course. I'll start with the testing. And by the way, you know, it's a, a smaller crowd and everything, and I don't have uh, 50 minutes to fill up with just the genetic algorithm solution. Should be able to talk about genetic algorithm and the app, the uh, neural network. Should be able to cover all that in far less than 50 minutes. So if you got any suggestions, anything you want to see, I got, as always, I got the Discord lecture channel open. So uh, if you want to see anything fun, we'll have a fun last day. Can we hack the 115 website they are working on right now? What's like the course website, the 115 course website? Let me try to hack it. It's probably just going to be static content, though. 115 web server. If you give me a link, try to break something. Um, put the poor website on internet hack. Uh, but uh, but the 115 website, just like the 116 website, you can't really hack it. You can't really break anything because it's just a static site. I mean, maybe you can. You can uh, you can DDoS it or, and bring it down, sure. But you can't really. There's no like private data to steal or anything to compromise so much uh, because there's no way to like send something to the server in a way that it's supposed to handle it. Uh, there might be ways to break it, but. There's very limited damage you can do to a static site. Static meaning it's it, it's just there to disseminate information. It's not there to to like let you interact with other people. All right, so let's talk about some testing. This is these are the tests that I used in Autolab for uh, for genetic algorithm. So I'm using 2017 data for the testing. I'm giving it the whole file. This read songs from file method I can't rely on in my testing. So what I need to do, which I should have done here, is create a separate object in my testing. So I'm creating a helper method in my testing itself to have my read songs from file. So I'm calling code from my own test file, which is something you can do, you could have done all semester. I guess it's kind of late to say that. But right in my application objective test, I'm creating more code, I'm writing more methods, just like we write the compare doubles method. Here I have a whole other object, which doesn't have to be an object, but I, I took my whole object full of file reading code and put it right in my test. That way I know this code's going to exist, whether I'm testing my code, whether I'm testing somebody else's code, whether I'm testing correct or incorrect solutions. This code is always there because it's in my test file itself. I'm not making an assumption that read songs from file will exist in the code that I'm testing, because that won't always be true. 
uh, because it's not defined in the document. That method doesn't exist in the document anyway. Uh, and I don't want to rely on the functionality of that in case it's implemented incorrectly. So I'm going to put that code right here and have all my reading a song from a file stuff uh, right there. So that way I can do read songs from file, but this is just like uh, creating a game state for homework four, where we had a helper method that created a game state. I'm doing the same idea here, because all this code is in my, my method here. Uh, I can get away with that one. Uh, and also, because I'm using a data file that's in, uh, that I know is going to be on the server, I guess that part's a stretch as well. All right, so once I have all that data, I'm going to generate some test cases by creating a map of user ratings, or several maps of use, user ratings. Uh, and you'll see this for test cases. This stuff gets kind of messy. I have a map of map of string to int to string. This is a map of the user ratings to the song that I expect to be the top rated song that the genetic algorithm should spit out. So I have a map of user ratings. If, with this map, since this song was rated a 5, I expect that to be the top song. I have these ratings. This is taking out, like I expect this with no ratings should be the top song. I'm taking that one out by giving it a 2. I believe this is the top 3 that I would expect. I'm knocking them all down by giving them low ratings and expecting that number 4 song. Uh, I'm giving one song a 4 and expecting that to be the best one, and so on. Uh, and then I'm going through all of those tests. I'm going to create, uh, call the genetic algorithm, give it the incubator on whatever particular uh, list of songs I'm working with, which is what I read from the file. And then giving it a cost function based on the map of user ratings for this particular test case. A little bit of print line. And then making sure that it returned that best song. Uh, so that's how my tests work for, for songs. Here's a whole mess of songs. Here's some ratings. Do you actually get the song with the lowest cost? Do you return the lowest cost song? For playlists, something very similar, a similar setup, except now instead of saying, this is the playlist that I expect, uh, since it's really hard to get an exact playlist, I do build in a decent amount of leniency on this one. I just put the score that you need to beat in order to get the best playlist. So the best playlist here has a score of 0833333. I say, well, if you get 09 or less, I'm OK with that. So you don't have to get the optimal playlist. You can have one of those songs be suboptimal, and it's still going to be OK for this test. And the rest of the setup is the same. Here's the user ratings, and then what I expect you to beat for the cost. User ratings, what I expect you to beat for the cost. I'm going to create playlists of length 2. Wait, that's not what that loop is doing. Uh, I'm going to go for each test case and run each test case. I always forget this. Until, so two times. Until is not inclusive. So two times, just to make sure you have good consistency. I didn't do that on songs. I didn't. And then do the same thing. Create our cost function based on those user ratings. Call the genetic algorithm. Get the incubator for those songs. Number of genes is two. I'm just checking playlists of length two for this. <coughs> Getting the cost of the playlist that was returned. Do some print statements just uh, so I can see the playlist. Helps me debug. And then checking, are you under that cost threshold? As long as you beat that cost, then even if it's not the optimal playlist or a optimal playlist, it's still going to give you credit for this test. So those were the two song-based tests. And then uh, I have my playlist, my playlist cost function. I guess I, come on. The playlist cost function, which I don't think I gave to you. No, I didn't give this in the handout. Uh, 
I used to require this as recently as last semester. And then this semester, I didn't require you to write the playlist cost function. So if you're curious of what cost function I used, um, we're using the song cost function, but we're not just straight up sum of the costs of the songs. That would be, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, that'd be fine. But we have something a little more complicated. We have the raw cost, which is the sum of the cost of the songs, but then also a cost multiplier. If the playlist contains a duplicate song, I wanted this multiplier to be so high that we're never going to get a playlist with multiple uh, duplicate songs in it because that's just a lame playlist. Or else uh, we're going to get the top rated song. You know, if we want a playlist of length 10, we're going to get the top rated song 10 times. And that's, yeah, it's the lowest cost, but it's not an interesting playlist. So I want to get duplicates out of there. And then we're going to check the standard deviation of the energy levels. I kind of feel bad. Not bad, but I don't know, uh, sad, I guess, that uh, we didn't actually use the energy levels at all this semester. I cut a little bit much, and uh, one thing that was completely cut were the energy levels at all. We didn't do anything with them. Uh, but this is where we used to use those. We would take the standard deviation of the averages of the energy levels of each song. Part of why I cut it is because that sentence is a mouthful, and everybody was doing the wrong thing um, th that I didn't want them to be doing. But you, for each song, take the average energy level and then take the standard deviation of all those averages. So the standard deviation of the energy, if that's less than 0.5, you give it a pretty you know, decent high multiplier, which is to say that we want playlists with a good variety of energy. Uh, this is what we, we wanted in our playlist. And if the standard deviation is sufficiently high, then one over the standard deviation is going to be our multiplier, and then multiply the raw cost with the multiplier, and that's our, our score. So we want the standard deviation of the energy to be as high as possible. Uh, so we get playlists with a good variety of, of high energy and low energy songs would be the ideal playlist, which is just something that I dreamed up. Uh, the reason I, I dreamed it up like this is you can't just take, you can't just sort songs by some factor and then take the top however many. You can't just call top K and get your best playlist. With something like this, it's sufficiently complex that you can't just take top K songs because as you switch out songs for the playlist, you're affecting how the other songs contribute to the cost of the playlist. Uh, so it justified using the genetic algorithm because solving this for, like running through all the math and solving this for the best playlist would be difficult. If I just give you a thousand songs and I say, give me the best playlist without using a genetic algorithm. With the genetic algorithm, it's easy. You have your cost function. You, you just throw it in the, the genetic algorithm. and the, It's just as hard as anything else with the genetic algorithm. Just make a cost function, make an incubator, and tell it to do its thing. But without a genetic algorithm or some other machine learning style of approach, this is going to be hard to find the best playlist. Of course, you could brute force it, just try every possible playlist and take the one with the minimal cost. Uh, but that's uh, quite large. If you want a playlist of length two even, you've got to try every combination of two songs. Um, not too bad, but, uh, but it gets, it gets uh, tedious. Um, so that was the idea between this, uh, this part that I cut from this semester. Which would be, I don't even know how I would solve this. This is a math problem. Like, given these songs actually compute the best playlist, I think that would be pretty tough to do. So, uh, uh, so that was the idea. That's sufficiently complex that you'll want that genetic algorithm. You'll be happy to have a genetic algorithm to be able to do this for you. You just write a cost function. This code is significantly easier than computing the best playlist. So, it's just not. Uh, not as difficult as a task. And you get to say, oh, hey, machine learning made that easy. <laughs> NSA.gov, no thanks. Hertz, w Hertz better be proud. I don't know if he saw me today. He better be <laughs> proud, though. Is there an advantage to making this its own object versus creating functions within the test code block? No, and as I was showing that, I was wondering why I did that. There's, there's no advantage. So all this 
these methods, these methods could easily just be right up here, just like we did with the other helper methods. There's no reason to have them in a separate object. It's just the way I set it up, and I'm not sure. Uh, I don't really remember how or remember why I did that. When you write the genetic algorithm, how do you know what constitutes high or low cost? I.e., how do you set the parameters for when the GA has found a sufficiently good candidate? I run it for, I'll get to the code itself. I'll run it for a fixed number of generations, though. Once it ha hits enough generations, I call it good. And then I can adjust the number of, of uh, generations until it works. So the other two tests were guessing random doubles. So I like these tests because it's very easy to see how well the genetic algorithm is doing. So the first one is just guessing a random double. I have a random hidden number that I'm guessing, which is going to range from negative 50 to 50. And I want to see if my GA can guess that number. So I'm going to create an incubator and cost function for this for single value, which I explained this to quite a few of you when you asked how to set this up. And I had some explanation in the document. Uh, and I think anybody who struggled with it was probably overthinking it, I, I would guess. But the incubator for a single value, oh, where's my class? I need the class first. So the single value class, there we go. So the single value class just has a single double. That's it. That's all it does. It just stores a double. End of story. That's it. The incubator for this, it's going to take a list of genes, a list of doubles that we assume is size one or at least one, I guess. And we're going to take the first element in that list, and that's the value that a single value stores. That's it. And then the cost function, give me a number, give me a guess, and I'm going to tell you how far away that guess is. So if you exactly guess the number, the cost is 0.0. .0. If you're off by 1, the cost is 1. If you're off by 0.1, the cost is 0.1. So now when I throw this cost function in this incubator at my genetic algorithm, I can effectively guess a random number, or rather I'm thinking of a random number, and then throw that in the genetic algorithm with that incubator and that cost function with number of genes of one, and see what the genetic algorithm spits out as the optimal value. And then again, like my print line debugging, or my print line just giving me information here, tell me what I computed and what the hidden number was and what the difference is between them. And if you have a, a Really, this is how you can really judge your genetic algorithm. If you have a really nice genetic algorithm, you should be getting damn close to that actual value. We'll see how close mine's getting. I, I don't know if I ran it with these exact parameters or that I remember what it ran, what it did. Uh, but we should be able to see how close we got. So I'm getting within four decimal places here, or within three, I guess, almost four. This one got pretty far. We should be able to guess those numbers exceedingly well for just guessing one double. That's a pretty, that's a, the easiest thing you can ask a genetic algorithm to do. It better do pretty damn good on it. Uh, for my testing, I said as long as you're within 0 0.01. As long as you're within 0 0.01, I'm going to call it good. Uh, so your genetic algorithm can't just be completely wild, although I did see one, two students last semester and one student this semester that I saw at least, uh, where their genetic algorithm was just guess like millions of numbers and take the lowest cost. Like come up with a million random ones, sort, take the best, and that's it, uh, which I don't like seeing. But the solution to that is to add another, oops, is to add another zero here, but then I'm going to end up... Uh, rejecting a lot of you who did write good genetic algorithms that just weren't as finely tuned. Uh, so I don't want to extend that out any further. And then for guessing two doubles simultaneously, it's literally just two doubles. Uh, the hidden thing, which is my hidden test case, which I'll spoil, is a class with two doubles. The incubator takes the first two doubles and assumes lists of length two. 
And then the cost function is the sum of the distances for the two values. And then guess them both simultaneously. And you have to be in, within 0.01 of both of them. So this one, we'll see how my genetic algorithm does. And it's going to do pretty nice. Even guessing simultaneously, it's actually surprisingly good. It's about the same as guessing just one of them. Um, I didn't expect it to be, be that similar. Uh, so with those two, those are the nice ones because I like those ones because you can visualize, like see exactly how well your genetic algorithm is doing. With the songs, uh, I saw a lot of you just create like hard code five or so songs and, uh, and run it and make sure that it got the best one. Like your genetic algorithm really should be able to do that. It's a pretty easy, uh, easy task. If you have five songs, give me the lowest cost one. Like as long as you create five sufficiently random animals, you know, you just take the min cost and it's fine. Um, but if you're doing the whole file, then it gets a little more dicey. Um, but you still can't visualize too easily how close or how far away you got from the correct answer. But anyway, let's get on with it. Uh, but that's how I did all the testing. Those were the tests that are in Autolab. Uh, what's the best way to store math.random so you can use the value it first generates so you can use it again? Why do you want to use the same one again? I might not understand the question, but I think in my explanation of my algo, uh, we'll probably end up covering it. So the algorithm itself, I use an animal class. I don't like lists of lists of doubles. Whenever I have nested data structures like that, I, yes, I know I just showed you a nested data structure, a map of maps or whatever, map of maps. Uh, but whenever I have nested data structures, I don't really like that. So instead of a list of list of doubles, I'm going to create a list of animals and create a separate class that's going to help me out. And this again, I don't, maybe I should advertise this more throughout the semester, but you can always create extra classes. There's nothing stopping you from creating more classes in your code. We did it all throughout homework too. You created tons of classes of your own design. You could still do that in homeworks three and four. Uh, so I created an animal class, which is going to have those genes as a state variable. And for some reason, no, it's cost in scaling. What do I, I missed this cost when I was reviewing things. Yeah, it's not used, that's why. This cost isn't even used. Uh, but it's going to have a constant for scaling to be able to get my initial genes. So if I want a random animal, and this is after I already have animals created, you'll, I'll, you'll see where I use this. Uh, create a random animal with the same number of genes that are going to scale from negative 50 to 50 in this case. I'm going to use the yield keyword too. And this is where I'm also going to have my mating code, my, uh, or my crossovers, and my mutations. Now, this is really the guts of how the algorithm works, is in your mating and your mutations, your crossovers and your mutations. And for our purposes here, specifically the mutations, I've seen, uh, I've seen quite a few students, and I test this with my own code, like if, you're mute, if your crossovers don't exist, you can still do really, really good with just the mutations. So like your mutations are where you're getting close to those random doubles and you just need to search the area right around that. Uh, just add a little bit of randomness to it to be able to get to that value. Uh, that really gets us where we want to go. But let me cover uh, uh, crossovers first. So for this, I'm going to check for each gene I'm going to create a new gene, which is going to have a lot of randomness. I love randomness. The genetic algorithm loves randomness. Randomness is your friend. The more randomness you can have, the better. So I like some randomness. So I'm going to do this thing right here, which I always call just flipping a coin. I'm going to flip a coin, and I'm going to have a 50% chance. So math.random gives me a random value from 0 to 1. If I say if a random value is greater than 0.5, I have a 50% chance of hitting the if. 
and a 50% chance of moving on to the rest of the conditional. So I'm going to have a flip a coin and then uh, have a 50% chance of just averaging for each gene, just averaging the two parents, and that's what the new gene at that location is. And then I'm going to have a 50% chance of not doing that. So if I hit this, I'm going to flip another coin, and then I'm just going to either take one parent's gene or the other parent's gene. So either I'm a 50% chance of averaging the two genes, a 25% chance of taking the gene of just one parent, and another 25% chance of taking that gene from just the other parent. And I'm doing this for each gene. So if we got 10 genes for each one, I'm going through this process of saying, do I either average the parents, take, uh, take one parent, or take the other parents? So some of you would have questions like, which one should I do? These are kind of the two methods to do it, either uh, decide which parent to take or average them. I say, why not both? And this is what I mean by randomness is your friend. Just code any idea you have and just add a whole bunch of randomness to be able to decide which one to take. If you have 10 ideas here, you know, say if math.random less than 0.1, if it's uh, 0.1 to 0.2, maybe this is what the question was getting at, by the way, uh, and check each range. I would just store this in a variable and then say if x is less than 0.1, else if x is less than 0.2, else if x is less than 0.3. You can do that all the way up to your else after checking less than 0.9. And you could have 10 different ideas here and randomly select one of the 10 to be able to choose what you want to do. But if you have multiple ideas, like as many ideas as you have, code them all up and then let math.random figure out which one to take. And then you'll have enough animals that for a particular situation, if one of those is the best way, if you have 100 animals, there should be 10 of them taken that way if you have 10 things coded. So randomness, randomness, randomness. Do the same thing with mutations. So with mutations, I got two major ideas for mutations. Either I mutate at, on a percentage basis or I mutate on a fixed basis. So either an amount that's close to 0.05 I want to mutate by 0.05-ish, or I want to mutate by 10%. And depending on the scale that I'm talking about, because I don't know if my solution's on the order of millions or if it's on the order of millionths, we can have huge ranges of how we're trying to narrow down when we're adding these mutations. I don't know where we're at, so if we're on the order of millions, I want to uh, mutate by percentage, by 10%, and get those kinds of changes. But if I'm on a more small scale, I might want to mutate by 0.05. Like, I don't know when the best is going to be, so I'm just going to flip a coin. For each gene, I'm going to flip a coin. If uh, for one condition, for 50% of the time, I'm not even touching that gene. I'm just leaving it alone. Don't even change it. The other 50% of the time, I'm going to flip another coin. And I'm either going to mutate by percentages or mutate by amounts. So a percentage by multiplying by 1 plus some random, uh, random value from uh, negative 0.05 to positive 0.05. Or, uh, so negative 5% to positive 5%. Or add a fixed amount from negative 0.025 to positive 0.025. So those are my, my two things that I'm either going to do. 50% chance of no change, 25% chance of changing based on a percentage approach, and a 25% chance of changing based on a fixed amount approach. And then random amounts and random percentages for each. Uh, so those are the most important parts, especially this mutation. Uh, mutating in this way is where I get most of my performance. This is where I tweak these values to really get performance out of this thing. Let's head over to the algorithm itself. Yeah. How'd you pick the amount? I, I tweaked it a bit. I would so I got my print statements in my tests. I would run it, see how good I'm doing, and then tweak the amounts until I got something that looked pretty good. So it is a little tailored to these particular problems, if I'm being honest. And then the genetic algorithm itself. 
The last, the big question a lot of you had is when to end the algorithm. I run it for, for a fixed number of generations, which I have set to 100, and a <coughs> fixed number of animals for each generation. So I have 100 animals running for 100 generations. I'm going to initially use my double yielding for loop. I mentioned this in lecture a whole bunch of times. Hopefully this isn't shocking to anybody. For the number of animals, and then for each animal, for the number of genes, math.random, convert that to a list, throw that in the constructor to an animal, and that gives me a list of 100 random animals with the appropriate number of genes. That's the double yield. I spoiled that in lecture multiple times, so hopefully nobody was stuck on that part. Is there a reason you did fixed number of generations rather than a percentage improvement from generation to generation? Yeah, sometimes you just don't improve from one generation to another. And if you're in the middle of, of the algorithm and you're pretty far away from the solution and you just happen to have a generation that doesn't improve, you're, you're screwed. Galileo. My TA told me to use 500 animals. Yeah, that's fine. 500 is going to be five times better, right? <laughs> it's just going to take longer. Uh, yeah, these, these values and the way I do the randomness, uh, this is far, far, far from the only way of doing things. Very, very far from the only way of doing things. This just happens to be the way I did things. If you want 500, if you want 500 generations, it's all going to work the same. So let's just do it. 500, 500. Let's run our two doubles. Works all the same. Didn't even get it that much better, actually. I'm going to blame Logan for this one. What's that? I'm blaming Logan. It is all Logan's fault. It's an understandable <laughs> answer. All right, so, so I set up my initial generation of animals. And then I'm going to use my helper method, which is going to count the number of generations. It's going to start at 100. And once I have no generations left, that's my base case. And I'm going to subtract one from the generations left each time I go through the recursion. So this code is going, this recursion is going to run 100 times. It's going to run for 100 generations and then return. Fixed number of generations. And yeah, any other, any other base case is problematic. I just talked about the percentage increase. You could do a zero increase. If there's no increase from the previous generation, you know, then it's done. But again, with all this randomness, you're just randomly going to have a bad generation that just doesn't improve upon the previous generation. It's just going to happen every once in a while. When you're talking 100 generations, you might just have a bad generation in there. It happens. Uh, some students like to do if the cost of the head of, I, well, I don't have it on screen, but if the best animal has cost zero, then return. Um, but there's not always a solution with cost zero. We just saw with the playlist that the best playlist is some non-zero value. Best songs, too, some non-zero value. Uh, so you can't say if, uh, if equals zero, if cost equals zero. Uh, I don't think that's much of a problem anymore uh, these days because I do have you doing songs and playlists, or at least songs. Everybody should be testing with songs because I force you to write the cost function. Um, so I don't think I, we really had that problem this semester. But in the past, I would show, I would do it the other way around. I would force them to write the code to test with the doubles, and then I would test with songs behind the scenes. And uh, I had that issue a lot, because they always wanted to say, if cost equals zero, then break. Um, so I don't think we had that problem this semester. So I have my animals that I'm getting from the previous generation. I'm going to create my animals that I send to the next generation, and I have to take my incubator and cost function along for the ride. So if we're on the last generation, I'm just going to sort the previous generation's animals and take the first one, throw it in, uh, no, I'm just returning the whole list, right? Yeah, I'm just returning the whole list in sorted order. Um, in sorted order by cost function, I'm going to sort by the cost of the incubated genes. I could just use the cost function there, right? Why am I? Oh, because of the way I have it set up. And then I'm going to return whatever I get from that. 
I'm going to take the head, the genes of that, throw in the incubator, and that's my best animal after the last generation. During, bless you, during each generation, I'm going to sort by the same thing, the cost of the incubated genes. That's going to give me a new list with all the animals sorted. And then I'm going to create the next generation. So we're almost done at this point. I just got to take all the pieces that we just saw, smash them together, and figure out how to get to the next generation. So I'm going to create a new list, which is going to be the best animals to start the next generation. So I'm going to take these animals, which are the, the best ones at the front, the way I'm sorting. I'm going to take the best animal. No questions, hands down, the best animal always goes to the next generation. Always, always, always. It's a mistake I see in office hours fairly often. You got to take your best animal and put it in the next generation. That's your best solution you've ever seen. Make sure it goes to the next generation. Uh, I'm going to cross over the best animal with the next three. And I'm only going to do this one, uh, one time. And then cross over the rest of the top four with each other. I could do more of these. Like I could just cut and paste these a few times. But I don't because I know where I'm getting my great, my best performance is in the mutations. So I'm going to create 20 mutations of the best animal and put 20 mutations of the best one into the next generation. This is where I get a lot of performance. This is my best animal. And this is always the dartboard analogy I say. You're throwing random darts at a dartboard. Whatever one made it closest to the bullseye, you want to duplicate that a lot with a little bit of randomness. Search that space. That's your best area to search. I'm going to search that 10 times, and I'm going to take my number two animal and search that area 10 times with 10 mutations. So I'm creating a lot of mutations. This is where I, I saw the best performance in all my testing. That's where I want to do a lot right there. So mutations. And then I'm also going to add in some random, uh, random animals. And this is the only time I use that. Um, where is it? Uh, that random method. I'm going to create random animals. This way, I, I already have the number of genes built into these animals. I'm going to create random animals and just round out the list. So until I have 100 animals again, for our purposes here, whatever the previous generation size was, uh, just generate random animals until we round out the generation again. And I have that nice and generic code, so if I want to change this, I don't have to worry about um, refiguring out my generation size and my random animals and everything. I ain't going to do that. I'm just going to let this loop round out the generation and then make the recursive call. And with this, we should be able to significantly decrease these generations. Oh, I did fail that one. Not quite that low. I don't not quite that low either. Let's try 50. We can have 50. We can get these down pretty low. So we can play with these numbers. I, I made sure they're high enough. 100 and 100 is, is high enough to really get where I need to be. Like 50 and 60, I think this should do it too. No, not quite. I got through some of the tests. But it's not consistent enough, I guess. But 100 and 100 works. And, those, and that's where, you know, if your genetic algorithm isn't quite highly tuned and isn't quite doing a great job, uh, you just crank up the number of generations and the number of animals. It takes longer, but it's, uh, it's going to get you where you need to be. This does take a lot longer than I thought. I thought it would roll through this in a couple of minutes. How can our code break Autolab? Be interesting. Uh, any questions on genetic algorithm? I didn't think that'd take 40 minutes, to be honest. Yeah, I could have just used the, the 0 to 1 for math.random.
But then I'd, I'd have to do the scaling somewhere else. So somewhere I want to be able to get values outside of that range. And I did it when I generated the animals. Uh, whenever I generate them, I always scale them uh, by that factor of 100. Yeah. So can we just take your gen algo and make a robot? Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's basically a robot already. <laughs> Technically, yeah. <laughs> it might attack you, though. All right, all right, what do we do? <laughs> what was, was there actual, was that just a joke or was there actual 115 server that I should break? Oops. Oh, thank goodness those are my scores. So, like, you can go to inspect element and just start, like, deleting shit. Like, you can always break a website <laughs> like that. Um, so there's that. But it doesn't break it for anyone else. I just broke the site for me. How do you break it for someone else? Uh, breaking a site for someone else is a little trickier. But you can, uh, I could show you the editor. This is something I, I always, uh, you can always have fun with. Let's go to Twitter. Oh, come on. So you can use this inspect element. Oops. set up. So you can use this inspect element to change the code of the page you're, you're looking at. Now, you can actually break, uh, you know, most big sites, like I'm not going to be able to break Twitter because Twitter's got every security hole plugged up. Uh, but you can still change the front end. So if you uh, do this, select whatever you want to change. Um, <laughs> I could screenshot that and share it, you know, <laughs> like it, it kind of drives me nuts when you see somebody like hacked Photoshop Twitters. I mean, unless they're trying to make it obvious, <laughs> but you can just change whatever you want. <laughs> Uh, take a screenshot. And, you know, it's, it's, it's that simple. Uh, so, one, this is easy to do if you want to play pranks on your friends. Don't try not to do actual damage, please. Uh, but, two, don't trust. When you see a screenshot of a tweet, like, holy crap, do not believe it unless you actually see it on Twitter itself or, you know, whatever the source is. Any... Any website, if you see a screenshot, don't believe it, please, <laughs> for the love of everything. Uh, you can just change that stuff. Uh, I, could break, uh, I could break cookie clicker. I guess that, I don't know. I'm kind of sick of that one, to be honest, though. So. Um, Oh, and uh, you kind of saw it on 116, but like, say you don't want this sidebar over here. If I can get the right pixel here. Uh, you just delete it. You go over here, you just delete it. Uh, and so you can modify the pages. Whenever you get a page loaded, like you you're literally downloading the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for that page on your computer. It's on your computer physically. You have access to it. You can change it. You can do whatever you want to it. So you can change the websites that you visit. Uh, but it gets tedious if you want to go in here and like constantly, oh, I want to change this every single time I go to this site. It gets, uh, uh, it gets boring. You want to modify any of this stuff. 
Uh, you can don't have to change it with that. You can change it with JavaScript. So if we find an element, let's try to do this quick. <coughs> let's find an element. Oh, they got such such crappy class name. Mm -hmm. uh, let let's let's just try to break something here with JavaScript. So for const lm of so I'm going to grab a class name and say for every element with that name uh, get element by class name where am I brace lm dot inner HTML equals sure. That's <laughs> just everything. <laughs> well, I didn't expect to get that much. <laughs> uh, but we got everything that was loaded on the page at the time. Uh, so if you get just the elements that are like uh, people's names or something, you can could say check for tweets by a particular person and then delete the associated tweet. So you could add in your own filters if you want to you know, not see a certain person's tweets. Uh, but you can do that with JavaScript, which makes it a little easier to automate. And then we can build what's called a browser extension, which is your JavaScript code that runs automatically when a page loads. So if you have some change you want to make to a site, you write a whole bunch of JavaScript, and then every you add it as an extension, and then every time you go to a page, uh, you get a little bit different experience, whatever experience you want. Oops. Like if I go to Netflix. Are you ready for the remix? I still, oh, that, just, that bugs me. I still got to scroll down. But when I go to Netflix, you'll notice that giant banner that shows up whenever you go to Netflix, which just starts screaming at you and flashes visuals and says, watch this stupid thing. Uh, that just goes away when I go to Netflix. Because I wrote an extension that every time I go to Netflix, it's going to find that div and just delete it. So it's just the same JavaScript I showed, uh, a little bit different, I guess, than I showed where I re was replacing text. But it's going to find that div and delete it. And if you go into... <coughs> I call it less annoying Netflix. So if you go into your extensions, you can load in your extensions. I, I don't have time to do a full tutorial of it. But if you do uh, search a tutorial of browser extensions, there's two parts to it. A manifest.json. Actually, I might have this open. No, I'm not going to. Is a manifest.json, which just has the configuration for it. And the rest is whatever JavaScript you want to write that you want to run on that site. Uh, so it's a fun way to, to break things, at least to change your user experience when you go to sites or be the first one to buy shoes, which is what people want to use it for. Uh, but it's fun things you can do to change your web experience, personalize it for, uh, for whatever you want it to be. Those numbers are out of date, but do your course evals anyway. All right, that's all I got. That's uh, that's one sixteen. Have a great summer, everybody. Might see you at some point. <laughs>